You have no idea what it was like. We didn't have cell phones. <laughs> if you did, they were like the flip phone or you pay as you go or like. My mom had a bag phone. You remember the bag phone? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Okay, oh it says they're alive. I should probably move this yes. out of the way so it doesn't look horrendous. Oh, no, you're perfectly fine. We are home office problems. <laughs> yeah. We're all working from home. Well, I'm in the office right now, but like no one's here. So that's why we're doing it at the office. But oh, yeah. and half half the day is like working from home and it's just such a weird transition, you know? Yeah, I haven't been back to my office since March. So it'll be really weird going back. Because <laughs> it, it's going to look like exactly how we left it. Like we all went in, grabbed stuff to work from home and left. And that's like the weird part, I think a little bit is like, Mm-hmm. I don't, you're like it, it seems like I was just here and uh I wasn't <laughs> yeah it's just it's gonna be weird like we didn't even pack up our athletic training room like we normally do <laughs> it's just love I love it <laughs> moment in time yeah we're we're living in the grand time and I'm sure We've got people watching already, so like this is great. Hey everyone! Ooh, hi guys! <laughs> Jumping in right where we're just chit chatting away before we get started. Um, talking about working from home and all that fun stuff because you know <laughs> things are great. <laughs> My dog is loving it. Yes, he's absolutely loving the fact that he sees me all the time. Although I think he's getting sick of me at this point. <laughs> I think most pets are, but like uh, they're so cute. He's like, oh, the humans are home again. <laughs> <laughs> Dare they be home? All right, but then he's like, take me to the park. You're home. Take me to the park. <laughs> oh, if only like, oh, a lot of our dog parts have kind of been like not shut down, but like you're not really supposed to go if there's other people there, which like defeats the purpose of the dog park sometimes. But you know, yeah. We have like a super big park near our house and like as long as you're wearing a face mask it's in social distancing it's fine. That's good. Sweet. It's like there's enough room there you could just spread out. Spread. Like yeah. yeah you don't have to go near a single person. Which can be super nice sometimes especially like being an AT where we have to be around people like all the time but now I've been away from people for so long it's like I yeah. need that human interaction back right it's like I miss everybody <laughs> let me go back to work let me go back <laughs> let me go back oh man good stuff good yeah one day living our best life guys oh yeah one day one day we will be there <laughs> not right now <laughs> not right now y'all yeah. we're getting there oh we got it couple of people have already said hey hey guys welcome hey guys. sorry I can't see comments because I'm just on zoom no perfectly fine we'll um read them off to you as we go if need be and um we'll have like a comment um or question I'm sorry not a we have the comment session going but we'll have que um, questions at the end for you if anyone has extras that weren't answered um but we just hit 12 30 um hopefully we have some more people coming on and we'll you know this is a live stream so it'll be live on our facebook for people to see who haven't been able to you know tune in right now um but um first of all we want to welcome you um and thank you for talking with all of us and women in athletic training um and we have a lot to learn and we're excited to hear from you directly and from some of our peers. And before we get started, let's, um, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and um, how you got into this advisory um, committee position and what you've learned kind of from it? Sure. So um, I currently am an athletic trainer at Salve Regina, which is a D3 in Newport, Rhode Island. Um, I'm also the medical coordinator for Base 8 Games, so um, that's my kind of my summer gig, which I'm in the middle of right now, even though we're not going. Um, and I've been an athletic trainer for almost a decade now, um, which is kind of wild. <laughs> um, and so I 
happened to stumble upon a mentor who was like, hey, I think you'd be great for EDAC. <laughs> um, and we had somebody who was rolling off for district one and it was just kind of a perfect timing thing yeah. um so he just kind of was like you'd be perfect for this like you should try it and everything and here I am three years later <laughs> <laughs> um and it's been great I've learned so much um you know we have such a great committee mm -hmm. um with people who are always open to learning and teaching and like I've learned so much from my peers um being on EDAC and um you know grown as a professional and it's just kind of really shaped the last three years of my career and it's been fantastic so i recommend if anybody wants to be on a committee like do it because it's probably one of the most rewarding things i've done in my career awesome that's great and hopefully we do have people reaching out especially now that we have a little bit of time for hands so let's reach out and try these new things learn and we'll you never know what we'll, we'll figure out and we'll be better athletic trainers, trainers overall. Sorry, stumbling over words. I haven't talked about it. So. <laughs> All right, so rolling right into some of the questions. Um, you know, we have um, about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven questions or so, um, but elaborate as much as you'd like. If, and then again, we'll have people ask questions if they have at the end. Cool. Uh, but so the first question we have is, you know, before we begin, begin can you please give us an entry-level guide and explanation to terminology um, that we as athletic trainers may hear during this discussion so we can best understand sure so there are um four terms really that you'll probably hear either a lot this week or next week during nata because we um have a lot of stuff going on um so diversity is definitely one of those terms we hear it all the time um we hear it through really anything that we do nowadays um and especially with patient-centered care we hear a lot and that's um mm -hmm. accepting people who are different from ourselves um or being more inclusive and accepting of students our athletes um our colleagues our coaches or doctors basically anybody that we come into um contact with um regardless of color uh, i'm sorry regardless of race national origin religion sex or sexual orientation Mm -hmm. um, and then the next term that kind of springboards into what we're going to talk about today is cultural competency, which is our set of attitudes, um, skills, behaviors, policies that enable us as a healthcare providers um, to provide that cross cultural care. So the care to somebody that is not of the same culture and background that we are. Mm -hmm. um, and that's respectful and responsive to that individual. Mm -hmm. um, individuals, patients, uh, patients, preferences, needs, and values. See, I'm stumbling over my words today too. <laughs> it's okay. Um, and then we have implicit bias, um, which is the attitudes or stereotypes that we aren't aware of yeah. within ourselves. Um, and we're kind of unconscious of those and explicit bias, which is the attitudes and beliefs that we express mm -hmm. um, and we're aware of. And then um, the other term that people are hearing a lot of that they may not know is um, BIPOC, um, which is an acronym that stands for Black, Indigenous, and People of Color. So um, it's kind of a much more inclusive term um, that um, is also a little bit more specific at the same time. Yeah. OK, nice. Thank you. Welcome. Um, so can you just tell us a little bit or not a little bit can you just tell us in general about the edac advisory committee and how athletic trainers can best utilize it as a resource so edac um started at quite a, in the 90s um mm -hmm. we went from a council to a committee which is um kind of the natural progression of things um well i think we were task force council committee i could be wrong on that please excuse me my brain is apparently not recalling right now um and we are we work as an advisory committee so um a lot of times what happens is other committees or other programs or um groups um like the boc or katie nata they come to us to say like hey is this culturally competent um when katie was going through um through uh the new standards we were you know, reviewing all of those and everything. So we kind of 
have expanded out beyond the NATA, which is really cool. Um, and we we work just to make sure that we're serving the needs of our patients and um, and our membership in the most culturally competent manner. Um, and um, we also advocate for sensitivity towards cultural diversity, the development of cultural competence within the profession. So um, if that makes sense. And we do a yeah. lot. So I'll kind of get into some of that because <laughs> we do a lot. <laughs> no, in that, so, that, I mean, it's so hard to just to explain one, one little facet, but you know. Right. It, yeah. It, really hard to just get like a general general <laughs> definition of what we do because we do so much stuff um outside of just being an advisory committee yeah. um so we have all kinds of webinars um we have cultural competency webinars we have um there's a uh, there's one that dr shingles did um on the professional development center um we have our town hall which is actually next monday during um during any vnata which is open to everybody so everybody's welcome to attend um we do an educational session every year this year it'll be on demand um we have an issue um a cultural competency issue in the nata news every year um we are this year for natas we're super excited to have vnata chats um, mm -hmm. which will we'll have three chats so one each day um where we'll focus on cultural competency um and from what i understand they'll be a little different every day so if if you want to tune in all three days you'll get some different information and there'll be different um subject matter experts during those um which on the graphic there should be all the times and stuff yeah um, let's see we also have our cultural competency um and our diversity page on the website um we have um we provide i lead scholarships um at, Oh. every other year so that's kind of something that we started with the last um not the last jcm the jcm before that where we had i lead and jcm at the same time and we were able to send a few students to i lead um which is super cool um we this year was the first year that we had capitol hill day grants which um capitol hill day went virtual so um we were able to still provide that experience in a virtual format okay. um we also have our diversity enhancement grants which our current grant cycles closed but that um it gets posted on nata when our next grant cycle opens um and those are every year so um, people who have projects that they want to do or that need funding they can apply for a diversity enhancement grant um, and potentially get it um i can't tell you how much we have for that but we we have a we give out a lot of diversity <laughs> grants um which is awesome. And then the other big thing, which unfortunately we couldn't do this year is our service day at NATA. So what we're doing this year instead is a call to service. So um, we will outside of convention time be doing a call and that'll be posted. So if anybody wants to come join us, they're more than welcome to. So we do a lot. Yeah, <laughs> um, and that's no. not, that's not, that's just kind of what we do as a committee. That's not all of the other stuff that we work with, um, with other groups with um, you know, writing articles and doing research and, um, you know, uh, being on task force and that kind of stuff. So the, there's a, there's a lot of moving parts. Oh yeah. And I can only imagine. And, um, man, that's like, there's a bunch of little things and that's awesome. And we are so mm -hmm. like, I honestly, I can't say, um, I knew a whole lot about your committee and all that you guys did. Like that's a lot more than what I was expecting. And that's yeah. uh, that's just my lack of knowledge. So this well, is great. Have, we do a lot behind the scenes too. So like um what a lot of people don't realize is we do a lot at convention. We do a lot during the year, but we also do a lot behind the scenes. So yeah. And the graphic that you mentioned before, we will be posting in the comments here um, soon enough. And so you guys can see, and we encourage everyone to obviously take part in the service call. Um, obviously, the more hands on deck, the more service that we can encourage and um, make a change. Um, but it kind of, uh, you know, well, rolling into the next question, sorry. <laughs> Um, how can we be better athletic trainers for our um, Black, Indigenous, people of color patients? Um, so, I mean, the biggest thing is making sure our environments are inclusive. Um, you know, making sure that 
everyone feels comfortable, everyone has a safe space. Um, as uh, Rebecca mentioned with LGBTQ+, that safe space training is so important. Um, I believe there's green dot training in the NCAA, there's all kinds of training um, and everything, but that education component for ourselves is super important too. So making sure we're doing diversity training, we're doing cultural competency training, um, those things are really important for us as healthcare providers to make sure that we're providing that inclusive, safe environment mm -hmm. um, for our patients, um, especially because we are the profession that works with such a diverse population on a daily basis, um, you know, and no two schools look the same. Yeah. Um, no two teams look the same. So, you know, we all we all really just need to do the best that we can to educate ourselves, but also say, hey, you know, this is a this is a place where we're not going to tolerate this. This is a place where we're not going to allow microaggressions and that type of stuff. Yeah. Um, and also increasing the diversity of staffs. So, um, you know, when when we're hiring um, athletic trainers, looking at our staff um, and, you know, making sure that it represents our patient population as well. And I know that's really difficult um, and it's not always the easiest thing to do, but just being aware of that is also very helpful yeah. as healthcare professionals. A hundred percent. What steps is athletic trainers um, can we take in order to create that safe space that you mentioned in that inclusive environment within the training room uh, for um, our Black, Indigenous, people of color population? Yep. So like I said, the inclusive environment, um, you know, making sure that we're not allowing microaggressions or that locker room talk, oh, yeah. um, I guess is the easiest way to put it, you know, like the, the stuff that you would only say in the locker room, <laughs> um, you know, teams are notorious for bringing it into the athletic training room um, and our facilities. And we just, we, we just can't let that happen. Um, speaking out is the most important thing, you know, calling people out saying, hey, that's not okay to say, but also educating them because they may not know, you know, they may not understand why it's not okay to say something. Um, but we have to really hold them accountable and also holding you know, our peers accountable, anybody that walks into our facilities accountable, you know, um, it's not just our, our student athletes, it's not just ourselves, it's everyone. So, um, you know, we just want to make sure that there's accountability and that we are understanding that people do need to learn, but we also have to say, hey, that's enough. Like, that can't happen. Yeah. And with that education process, you know, what steps can educators take to cultivate more culturally competent athletic trainers, especially those students who may be naive or unaccustomed to working with the um, Black Indigenous people of color community? So I think for, um, for preceptors and clinical educators, taking that preceptor training on cultural competency is super important to start because we can't expect our students to be culturally competent if, we are, if we're not. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and understanding cultural competency is a spectrum. So, you know, you, you kind of run on this spectrum of being super culturally competent, which is extremely difficult to being culturally competent within your population and, and that type of stuff. So, you know, we have to make sure that we are following the right steps in order for our students to um, giving them diverse clinical experiences. You know, I know it's sometimes difficult in certain areas to get certain experiences, but trying to get those experiences for our students. So we're exposing them in a manner in which we're also educating them at the same time and not just throwing them into um, that scenario once they're certified is super beneficial. Um, and also providing our students with cultural competency training, um, you know, making that part of it. And, you know, we do have cultural competency modules um, and proficiencies now within that so kind of building all of that into into an education setting is fantastic for students and then allowing them to go into a clinic and apply those things is kind of reinforces what they're what they're learning. <laughs> oh, you're perfectly fine. <laughs> While we're like trying to, you know, like you said, like the cultural competency is a spectrum. And there's only so much sometimes that we as educators can do right there on the spot. What are some resources that you recommend um, us as athletic trainers in general, read articles, books, or whatever, mm -hmm. or to even recommend to our students to help start that those gears turning um, 
whether that is so we're not learning maybe as a group, but also furthering that education one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, sure. So um, follow the EDAC page on Facebook <laughs> and or on Twitter. Um, we post kind of everything that we're doing there, um, <laughs> you know, and, you know, reading articles, um, attending lectures, doing the trainings. Those are great places to start. Being here is a perfect start, um, you know, and then kind of building upon that next week with everything that NATA is offering is the programming is fantastic that um, is happening next week and I'm actually really, really excited about it. Um, so those are great places to start. Yeah. And then, you know, um, kind of taking it from there and doing some more webinars and reading research articles and then kind of doing self assessments and check ins and that type of stuff is great. Um, because you the self-assessment is fantastic because you get to see kind of where you stand and then you can build off of that from there. Okay. So, um, you know, but being here today is the perfect start um, and watching this is the perfect start. So um, everybody's got to start somewhere, um, right. you know, and even if you just listen in on the chats or listen in on town hall or, you know, just watch the, the um, education session, like those are great places to start, so. Oh yeah. And the, you mentioned the self-assessment. Is that something that's also located on the EDAC um, page? Or? That is not. Um, there are a couple of different ones. And um, in the cultural uh, competency webinar, um, they go into more detail about that. So I highly recommend that webinar. It's fantastic. OK, sweet. Definitely will be checking in on that one. <laughs> um, and then you know, understanding intersectionality, which is a new word for many of us and uh, uh, Rebecca talked about it last time as well when we um, did the um, NATA LGBTQ plus advisory committee um, interview but um, but with understanding intersexuality it's it's key to better understanding how each of our descriptors meets up with another and okay I did this last time let me start that over it's a paragraph I'm so sorry it is okay Sorry, listeners, you saw me last time mess it up. I'm messing it up again, I promise. <laughs> I'll get it better. Um, I swear I, were, I read these before these this interview. <laughs> okay, so understanding intersectionality, it's key to better understanding how each of our descriptors meet up with another and the influence it has on how we talk, how we walk around in the world. The intersectionality of Black, Indigenous, people of color and LGBTQ plus persons create a heavily marginalized community. Can you expand on intersectionalities like these and how we as athletic trainers can further educate ourselves to provide the best care possible, which obviously is our overall end goal as athletic trainers? So I think um, Rebecca put it perfectly in the last <laughs> interview, um, so I won't go too, too much into it because I can't say it better. I really, I really can't, um, <laughs> you know, but I think the most important thing is to remember that people are made up of so many social determinants. It's not just being female. It's not just being um, BIPOC. It is not just being living in the Midwest or living in New England or living where you live. It's not just your family culture. It's, you know, we're so much more than that. And all of those things make up who we are. So they all intersect. And so um, that's kind of where this concept of patient-centered healthcare has come from, is that you know, people aren't just their injuries. They're not just what they look like. There's, there's a whole person that we have to take care of. Um, and so I think understanding those concepts really will help us as athletic trainers. Um, you know, we, we do a much better job of um, treating the person because of the relationships that we have mm -hmm. versus, you know, somebody who may see a patient once every six months. Um, you know, we develop relationships with our athletes, which is fantastic and, and everything. Um, so we have to just remember that we're treating a person and not just an ankle sprain. Yeah. Um, and all of these different things make up this one person and they may have nothing in common with us, mm -hmm. but they're still a person. Um, yeah. I guess this is the best way I can put it, <laughs> building <laughs> off of, off of what Rebecca said. Um, and, you know, part of that is working on our cultural confidence. Yeah. Um, you know, we work with, like I said, those super diverse populations. So making sure that we're always working on our cultural confidence will help, um, you know, but also understanding our shortcomings. We're not going to be perfect. Yeah. Um, and it's okay. So we just have to be open-minded to that. We may get corrected or, 
you know, we may say something that didn't sit well with somebody and, and have to admit that like, Hey, I'm sorry. I said this. I didn't realize that. Can you please be like, I will do better. Um, you know, and, um, and just always be learning. Um, and in increasing the diversity within our profession, I think is the other, the other really big thing. Um, you know, and kind of, we also have to expect other people to not do the work for us. Yeah. You know, we have to do that work. I have to do that work as an individual. I can't expect my friend or my colleague to do that work for me. Yeah. You know, I can't expect that emotional labor um, from somebody else. I have to do that because if I don't do the work, then I'm not going to change or I'm not going to be able to learn. So, um, you know, and it, and it's okay. You know, it's, it's okay that you don't know everything and it's okay that somebody says, Hey, that wasn't cool to you. Um, you know, we have kind of learned behaviors from uh, that we learn as a kid and from the environments that we're in and everything and unlearning those behaviors is hard. Um, yeah. But we also have to not be offended if somebody says like, hey, what you said isn't okay. Or somebody comes in rip roaring and you call them out and they get mad at you like, you know what? It's okay. Um, so, you know, and we just, and I always, <laughs> I always say this, we have to be gentle with ourselves and gentle with others and understand like this is a learning process. Um, and it's a very difficult learning process. It's yeah. not something that's that you're going to learn overnight. It's not something that you're going to learn in a year. It's, it's a lifelong learning process. So, you know, we can't, um, we can't get defeated when things kind of get tough. Um, and, you know, we just got to keep that open mind and, and keep moving along and, and just learn the best that we can. Yeah, that is, you said you couldn't say it better than Rebecca. I'm not saying that you said it, like you guys had both great explanations, but like very, um, specific to kind of each advisory committee. And I think that's great. And, um, you know, both you guys both kind of mentioned that, you know, this is a self, it's a hard learning process, but you have to do the work yourself. And I think that I can't that stress that enough that, you know, if you aren't willing to do the work, kind of like it, you know, in, in classes at, in whenever we were in undergrad, um, wherever you at, you're at in your education, like you've got to do the work to understand it. You can't rely on someone else to kind of give you the answers or anything like that. So, you know, it's that same kind of educational learning and it's just, a, it's can't, they're not the same learning process, but you know, um, you kind of get the yeah. similarities, but um, we are welcome to um, take any questions. If any of you guys are watching, have any um, in the meantime, while we're start searching for any questions, um, do you have any additional information that you'd want to share with us that we may not have covered? Um, something that you think that is super important for us as athletic trainers or even just women in athletic training that um, we need to get like the biggest takeaway and start implementing right away. Um, I think it's super important that we remember like we are still on the front lines no matter what we're doing, whether it's cultural competency, whether it's inclusion, no matter what it is, we are still on the front line. Um, you know, our patients have that trust in us yeah, um, and they have that belief in us. And we just have to remember that, you know, athletic trainers are so, like, we have such a great profession. We have a profession that does things that nobody else does, right. um, you know, not to toot our horns, but <laughs> we really, we really do. And, you know, we have um, especially those of us that work in collegiate athletics, we have, you know, student athletes who are away from home for the first time for us to work professionally or in industrials, we have people who are away from their families and, you know, we're kind of that person that people look to, to take care of them. And yeah. not kind of, we are the person that yeah. we look to, to take care of them. Um, so, you know, we just have to remember that, you know, it's that, we're there taking care of people in the best way that we can. And we have, we're just doing the best that we can at this time. Um, you know, the next few months are going to be hard. They're going to be tough. There's a lot going on in the world right now. And um, we just have to just try our best and we can't expect perfection, but we can definitely work as hard as we can and do, do right by our, our patients. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, it doesn't look like we have, or, yeah, I can't talk. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, it, we don't seem to have any comments right now, um, but feel free to, if you, 
members, if you have questions, um, feel free to drop them below and um, we will be able to feed them back over to Rebecca here and get some answers. We will be dropping that um, image and that graphic with all the information for uh, the town hall meetings that she mentioned before. And we encourage you guys all to attend um, to kind of build onto that next step. This is the introduction that will be, you know, that next step. Mm -hmm. um, oh, we just had a question come in. <laughs> Sorry. Um, oh, no problem. <laughs> nope. So um, do you have any suggestions or examples of initiatives that encourage diversity in the profession, things that national or regional EDACs have done and have found successful? So um, we have a lot of stuff in the works right now. Yeah. Um, that's kind of been in the works for a while. It, things take time, of yeah. course. Um, we, I cannot speak to regionally what every, each ind individual region does. I just know what we kind of do up here in District 1. Um, I, we all do service projects. Um, at EATAs a couple of years ago, we did a student mentorship service project. Um, so, you know, um, mentorship is huge with our, our um, ethnically diverse students. Okay. Um, and bringing them in. And I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Because it was... No, you're very fine. She, so she mentioned that she's on the, a state board. Mm -hmm. And um, what are, how can you facilitate or do you have any suggestions or examples of initiatives that help encourage the diversity within the profession? Sure. Yep. Yeah. So like I said, the mentorship, um, you know, uh, working with programs to make sure that students are ethnically diverse um, and all of that. Um, and not only that, but getting our ethnically diverse athletic trainers um, involved early. We have a lot of students who are eager to help. We have a lot of new grads who are eager, eager to help and YPs that are eager to help. You know, um, getting them involved, um, reaching out to your EDAC rep to see if they have anybody that they think might be interested because we have people contact us all the time wanting to get involved. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, doing kind of those things. And then um, there is the leadership and diversity um, educational session. <laughs> Words are evading me now. Um, <laughs> educational session that's actually on demand next week, which has, um, which uh, Lynn and David, who are, um, Lynn Nakagawa and David Gallegos, who are district directors, talk about increasing diversity within um, our profession and within our leadership, um, along with uh, Keisha Harrell, who is our EDAC chair, and Marissa Holiday, who's another EDAC member. So, so is that webinar um, is that through the NATA like Career mm -hmm. Center? Okay. So, so it'll be a part of the convention. Okay. Um, so it'll be on demand through the convention, and I highly, highly recommend it. It's a fantastic, um, a fantastic uh, education session that I'm super, super proud of. Perfect. Um, and then let me see here. I'm, gonna try, I'm sorry, I'm reading through some of these things. Um, I want to make sure that we answer the question with everything. Um, are there any, are you like through our EDAC program with NATA, are we working with other um, like EDAC programs, maybe not necessarily associated with athletic training um, to see how we can better um, improve our profession overall by seeing what other you know kind of standards are being set so that we can help start working from the small all the way up to the big if that makes sense yeah um so not that i'm not aware of any other outside organizations that we're working with i do know we work with katie and the boc um okay. we have worked with katie and the boc so um i know we all think that they're under nita but they're not there <laughs> separate <laughs> entities but um so we do a lot within our profession um maybe in the future we'll do some stuff with other professions but um i'm not currently aware of any we may be i there's so much going on <laughs> <laughs> no we're really fine i was just i was wondering and um kind of like was a second question to the one that was asked before so i want to make sure we got all of it um but uh, it looks like we may have gotten all of the questions answered um again if you, members if you have any other additional questions please feel free to like drop them below or reach out to women athletic training um or message us through the page and we can help facilitate a conversation 
whether it's now or after NATA um, for another live session, or even just like an inf infographic with more information. Yep. And um, we have um, a few, we have like our diversity infographic. We have a few things that are coming out. And then later in the year, our, um, our cultural competency NATA news is coming out later right. this year in the fall. So we there'll be tons of stuff coming out. So um, if people have any questions or anything, they can reach out to their EDAC rep or, you know, here or wherever. Yeah, no, happy, happy to help and um, definitely reach out to your EDAC. They'll probably be more of a better uh, resource than reaching to us to be the middleman. But either way, we would happy to, if you haven't noticed, we're, we love graphics, infographics. Um, we make a lot of them, we post a lot of them. Um, so we will be posting those, as, especially as they start coming out um, for all of our members to make sure that they are aware and that they can start implementing those things within their athletic training room. Um, I think that may be all that we have today. So I, from the women athletic, all women athletic training, we want to thank you and, um, EDAC for everything that you guys are doing. And, um, we look forward to talking or, well, listening, sorry, listening to you next week at VNATA. Um, it sounds like you guys have a lot of great programs coming up and, um, thank you again for taking the time to talk to us today. And thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. And, you know, I really look forward to seeing all of you guys um, next week and over the course of the next few months and years and everything. So thank you so much. Nope. Thank you. And so members stay tuned. We will be, um, you know, posting more of these infographics and more information um, so that you can stay tuned next week. And thank you for uh, coming and watching this and learning a little bit more about EDAC. Um, and have a great, I almost forgot what day it is, but it's Thursday. Have a great Thursday, guys. <laughs> All right, we are signing off.